G'day legends and welcome to this episode of the Cricket Mentoring Podcast. I'm with a friend, a very good cricketer, Naomi Jatani. Naomi, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Naomi is the captain of the Middlesex women's cricket team and a very good cricketer. She's out here at the moment playing club cricket for Midland Guildford in the um, WACA Premier Women's Cricket Competition and is has done a little bit of coaching for us here at Cricket Mentoring and I've done some coaching with her. So Really looking forward to this conversation, getting to know her story a bit more and sharing it with you guys. So, as always, let's take it back. Yep. What's your first memory of playing cricket? Um, so, first memory would probably be, I think, the same story, older brother um, in, in the garden. Um, but we used to play a lot of different sports, so we used to be quite inventive. We used to play, obviously, cricket, basketball, a bit of hand tennis, volleyball, everything that you could ever imagine. And... Um, yeah, my brother would always want to bat in the garden, so I kind of started bowling. We had a small little lane to to try and get the ball down and use the wheelie dustbins as the as the wicket, so a big target to aim at, but um, that's kind of how, how it all started. And every summer we'd probably play in the back garden and break a lot of my mum's <laughs> plant pots too, so she wasn't very happy with that. But... Um, yeah, so we kind of make up the rules as we go. If a certain plant pot would be a certain amount of runs, be six and out um, if you hit it over the fence. So yeah. you have to <laughs> learn to hit the ball on the ground from a, from an early age for sure. Awesome. How old, much older is your brother than you? Uh, he's five years older. Yeah, um, awesome. And so did he drive you to be better? Did he inspire you to try and get to his level? Yeah, I think he, he he's very competitive. So he always would come up with different ideas and different almost training techniques to you know throw the ball and catch it under fatigue and all these kind of weird things that we'd come up with um so he you know he was definitely the first first influence on my career um playing the game and he was kind of the one who encouraged me to kind of take it to the next step awesome and was he getting inspired by cricket on the tv or where was so you were sort of probably getting inspired by him i suppose he was taking you outside but where was he getting his inspiration from? Um, I think he was just a sport lover, so he would watch lots, lots of things, football, cricket, everything. So I guess he just wanted to try to see what would happen if we played cricket, if we played football, if we played basketball. Um, so, yeah, he, he kind of pushed me to keep going and we kind of cricket became the sport that I became really good at quite quickly. Mm, awesome. It's amazing how um, players in the backyard, their their game as professionals has been shaped by their environment in the backyard. Yeah. And whether it's, okay, there's a gap over there and you get four runs for that. And like you say, hitting the ball on the ground is something you had to do from a young age. Yeah. And so you keep the ball on the ground now. It's something you're good at. It's, it's fascinating. How did you progress from the backyard to competitive cricket? Um, so my brother went online and had a look around at the time and found a boys local boys cricket club, it was Perivale Cricket Club at the time. Um, and so we just turned up and um, I think it was an indoor indoor session at the time. And I just looked around, it didn't even phase me that there was I was the only girl um, in, in the hall. And he was like, are you going to be okay? You know, I was like, yeah, we'll just get get on with it. Um, How old were you at this stage? Do you uh, remember? I think I was like nine. Okay, nine and just old. to give our viewers some more context, whereabouts in the world? This is in London, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, west. So West London. Um, literally, it was five minutes down the road, nearby Ealing. Um, and so yeah, we started training, training there. Played an indoor cricket league with them, um, and kind of just started playing the season, the summer season for them every weekday evening we had a or well, every Wednesday evening for example we had a, a game we'd play against someone um and then yeah it was a it was probably an exciting time and I'm actually really thankful for my coach at the time there. Um he's kind of the one who invested in me at the time and thought, well you've actually got something here. Mm. And I assume you were playing with boys your age and your brother was off with an older age group? Weirdly my brother actually never played cricket externally from um from the back garden um so like i said he was just a sports lover his, his game was more football um so all the boys yeah were my age um and the only girl in the team there was no female dress dressing room at the time i had to go change um somewhere somewhere else um so a lot of lot of difficult things there and same i played boys cricket at my high school too 
Um, and yeah, it was it was a little bit challenging. Yeah. Um, but it was probably a good thing at the time now that I look back. So you got into the Middle Six Academy very early. What age was that and how did that all come about? Um, so I think there was a guy that kind of rocked up to Paraval Cricket Club and he was in the Middle Six kind of system and said, oh, do you know that there's an under 11s Middle Six squad? I said, no, I didn't even know girls played cricket. Um, so this was an under 11s girls squad? Oh, squad, yeah. yeah. So... Um, and at the time, you know, if you could catch a ball and you could hit a ball, you're getting into the squad at the time. The competition was quite um, low. So from then I started Middlesex under 11s and kind of worked my part way through that pathway um, till today. Awesome. So, yeah, you're obviously still with Middlesex. So it's yeah. been a, a sort of a 13 or 14 yeah. year journey with them, I suppose. Um, how influential throughout this time, throughout all your career, I suppose, yeah. has have mentors been and who has been influential in your career? I think um, I'm quite thankful to a lot of the organisations that I've been a part of. So Perivel, my high school, um, my PE teachers there, you know, they were really supportive of me having games on the weekend and being a bit lenient on my homework. And I think I was a mixture of people. And then when I got to Middlesex, I had a coach for all recruits at the time who kind of pushed me along into kind of emerging players programs and training with academy boys at the time when I was 14, 15. And so he was a big influence then. Um, and then, yeah, just going through the systems like Loughborough University, I had Sally Ann Briggs, who's now the coach of um, Hobart Hurricane, so a really good influence there at the time. And then more recently, Sanjay Patel. And um, so I think there's a lot of coaches that have dipped in and invested in my time and I'm really thankful to everyone who's who I've worked with over the years. Mm. And what stage did you think? Obviously, women's cricket's been changing dramatically in the yeah. last sort of five to ten years. At what stage did you think this is something I want to do at the highest level? And maybe it wasn't I want to make a living or be professional, yeah. but I want to do this and take this seriously. Um, I wasn't actually sure. I didn't really watch much cricket, and I didn't know what was ab like around. And I kind of just rode the wave through um, going, uh, they had junior super fours, what they called at the time, so you best 40, 50 players under 16 or under 17. And I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know you could take it even further than that. Um, and so I kind of just rode the wave and never really thought I was actually good enough to become like better or play at a high level. Um, and so then I, I think the turning point was when I joined Loughborough University and they had this MCCU program, yeah, gym twice a week. And is yeah, this 18 or how 18 old? years old, yeah. yeah. So all of a sudden I've gone to university, which I went for my degree in sports science and then realised, oh, there's such a great cricket program here. Um, so yeah, gym twice a week, training two, three times a week, cricket skills, um, recovery, games every every week um, and I fell in love with that whole training program and just realised oh there is more to this than than I than I thought um, and that kind of kick-started my um, me working harder and, and trying to get to the next level from there. Amazing now let's wind it back even again yeah at 14 you made your debut for the Middlesex women's yeah. team yeah that must have been pretty remarkable. You're playing with women. Were there some England players in the team? Yep. So we had um, Beth Morgan at the time. She she play um, ex England international now, but she was someone I looked up to when I was 14 years old. She was my captain at the time. Um, and yeah, when I when I debuted, you had you were playing against players like Charlotte Edwards, um, Claire Taylor. You know all these all these Ishigua. They're all all girls that are the legends of the game at the moment so you know I'd, I'd walk onto the pitch and I'm bowling and I'm like oh, I'm actually bowling to some really good players here um, and I didn't really think much of it at the time you just you're young you don't really know what's going on yeah and you just bowl and hope for the best that you you have a good debut so started quite early for sure um, but it was a good experience to be around early and mm. and know that I've got to take someone's place mm. eventually and work hard to do that. Mm. Now, you're an all-rounder at the moment. You're working hard at both bowling and batting. You're really 
very good at both, but what were you getting picked on for back then as a 14-year-old? Uh, it was my bowling, so I was left arm, left arm bowler, um, and that's kind of how I started my career was my was my bowling. So um, coming in, maybe first change um, and trying to swing the ball in at the time, and so bowling was my main skill for for a long time, actually till about 20 years old. Um, yeah. And then is that when you decided I need to take my batting more seriously and really work hard and become an all rounder? Yeah, I think so. I, I was almost not getting picked into teams because of my batting, and I thought, well, oh, I need to. I need to work on it um, a lot more and work on my technique and really just catch up in a way and hit as many balls as I can to make that a, a really strong second skill. How did you go about doing that? Um, I think, again, Loughborough, we worked really hard and um, Sal and I would look at my technique and video, like, what you know where my head was going and, and, and that was kind of the starting point. And then when I came to decided to come to Australia and, and do that. I worked so hard on my batting. I think I must have hit like 800 to 1,000 balls a week to just really just try and catch up. It would be underarms, um, just grooving the technique and just keeping it nice and simple. I would even like feed to myself if I didn't have anyone to feed to, like put the ball under your chin and just hit hit to the back of the net. And so I spent a lot of time doing that, just just trying to catch up mm. with all the years that I missed beforehand. Mm. Amazing, and that's the self drive and discipline that the best yeah. athletes have. Um, tell us a bit more about your time at university. So you were studying exercise and sports science. Yeah. You're in the Loughborough Uni program. So it was three three year yeah, exactly. program. Were you playing a lot of cricket then, and was it um, what sort of level was that? Um, that was a really good uh, level, so we'd play every Wednesday against other universities, uh, 50 over games, um, and we'd have a lot of travelling involved in that. Were there other, prof like not professional, but girls that, are, that had played um, for their, their county? Uh, yeah, and, and so in the last result, I was actually really fortunate to be amongst, I think it's seven of the girls who currently play for England now, and they were in the system then, so... Actually, me and three or four others, we were the minority in the uh, in the Loughborough squad. There was eight girls, nine girls who were in England Academy all playing for England. Wow. So um, it was a really competitive um, environment to be in. And, and that's probably what made me a lot better, being, being able to bowl against better batters and being able to bat against better bowlers like Anya Shrubsoll, uh, Catherine Brunt, who was there as an assistant now and again. Um, so that kind of set up force you along and everyone was the rest of us were all county players too mm -hmm. so um, and when we played against other universities you'd have a f handful of county players from going to those universities so the standard was was pretty good mm. um so yeah that's probably that competitive and nature allowed you to get better because you're playing with better players yeah um, and now you touched on you came out to australia so yeah. did you finish your uni degree and then come yeah. straight out and that was something you did for the obviously to better yourself as a cricketer. Yeah, so I, I kind of said to myself, you know, a lot of coaches had said to me I had a lot of potential, and I kind of hadn't given myself a chance to, to explore that. Um, so I finished education. And I decided I'm going to dedicate the next six months to to going out to Australia. I also wanted to travel as well. So it kind of um, I got to achieve both those things. Um, but just being out in Australia for six months, pretty much by myself, um, with no one around, I had no, I had no, I didn't know anyone in Melbourne. Um, how did it, how did you get to Melbourne? How did the process of getting to Melbourne happen? Um, one of the girls from Middlesex at the time, she had come to Paran Cricket Club, and for for six weeks, and she said, "Oh, you know, why don't you get in contact?" And actually, I met the men's head coach in London because they were on tour. Um, and we met for a coffee and he said, look, this is what we can do for you. This is our coaching setup program. And then it kind of happened from there and, and you know, had a really good setup with accommodation and, and, and everything there. So we just carried on, got going from the, from ball one and 2020 games, 50 over games. The coach there, Carl Sandry, was um, probably one of, the most important coaches I've had in my career as a turning point for my batting. He helped me so much, invested so much time into into me. Uh, again, noticed that potential and 
we just put in hours and hours of hitting balls together and and again very thankful for what he's done for my batting because that's kind of shaped us how I bat now. Awesome. So when you're in Melbourne, were you yeah. working? Were you doing anything? How were you surviving and how were you making the cricket dream stay alive? Um, so I'd saved up a lot before I came came uh, there. My parents supported me as well with, with flights and everything. And then um, coaching-wise, would coach at the junior club opposite the road um, three or four times a week. Um, had a few one-to-one -one girls uh, whilst I was out there, which was great, and um, keeping an eye on how they're going at the moment too. Um, so that was kind of how I supported myself and done a bit of work for Cricket Victoria at the time in their junior junior setups and um, under-18 competitions too. So very fortunate that the club sorted all that out for me, um, and that's how I supported mm. myself mm. Um, and having the time to train um, away from coaching as yeah. well. It's, it's um, obviously women's cricket is still behind men's cricket and it's yeah. changing fast but something that I try and sort of uh, I suppose get across to our viewers and our listeners is how hard sometimes the women have it yeah. or have had it when they're chasing their dream they have to maintain a job or do part time yeah. job or do this and that whereas sometimes the men haven't had to um, I'm fortunate to have been and played overseas I'm obviously growing up in Australia I played in the UK and played for Middlesex as well but I know there's a lot of pressure that comes with being an overseas player, even at club level. Yeah. How did you deal with that as a 21-year-old? I think um, I was quite lucky in that no one really knew who I was when I came over. So I kind of had a blank slate. And um, just before I came out there with Middlesex, I was 12th all the time. So going to Melbourne, no one knew who I was. Yes, I might have been an overseas, but... They had no idea what I had done in the past or any any recollection of my stats or anything. So I was going on a blank slate and I actually felt no pressure um, because they didn't know who I was. Um, obviously, I put some kind of pressure on myself that I wanted to come out here and, and score runs and take wickets and all this kind of stuff. Um, but because there was no expectation from anyone, it was a lot easier to just enjoy the process of working hard and and just going out and putting into practice what I was what I was learning. So um, in that sense, it was really quite easy and enjoyable to be on the pitch with a new bunch of people, get to know them, and almost kind of just be myself without mm. without anyone worrying um, or having painted a picture of you before beforehand. Mm. Now you went back to England and you yeah. did really well, which we're going to touch on in a minute, but. What were the key lessons or takeaways from your six months in Australia the first time? What do you think you took home? And I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah. It's three or so years ago. So it's, but what do you look back on now and think were real pivotal sort of moments of that six months? I think it was the space. Um, I had a lot of me time in between training sessions um, and I almost got to understand how I operate, how, um, you know, that maybe... I didn't have much self belief or I didn't I wasn't that confident um at the time and kind of just understood how my nerves came into a game. I was just a bit more aware of what I was thinking. Um there was no distraction, so it was literally me and my thoughts for a lot of the time and I had to kill a lot of time. So I think that was the biggest thing I learned and then I was able to kind of harness that and and put that into a routine of some sort and kind of understand this is Okay, I'm getting a little bit stressed now on the cricket pitch. I could probably need to just chill out again how I was back at home and then go and then carry on. So I think that was the biggest lesson. It was more the off-field stuff that I learned about myself, mm. which enabled me to work on the on-field stuff because I think they definitely both exactly the same. If you know how your mindset works off the field, you're going to know how you're going to operate on the field mm. when, when there's high pressure moments or high adrenaline moments for sure. Mm. And obviously you spent a lot of time working on your batting. Yeah. You went back and you scored your highest sort of score yeah. of 72 for Middlesex against Sussex. Yeah. And the, at the time the England women women's coach, yeah. um, Mark Robinson, was watching. He then elevated you mm. to the England Academy and you also got picked up by one of the Kia Super League sides. Yeah. Firstly, that must have been a great feeling to have yeah. sort of shown yourself and the people that had invested in you up until that point that your batting was capable yeah it was um it was a bit of a whirlwind season i came back and 
we had a, we had a new co Middlesex coach, Sanjay Patel, then again he had no idea what I'd done in the past either, so all of this stuff he was like, oh, why were you batting at nine last year and do you want to open the batting and then got, got this opportunity and everything just kick-started, I almost had to take a step back in a way and look, realise, oh my god, this is actually happening, all the goals that I had written down, they're actually happening and it kind of came quite quickly on me and I didn't know how to handle it either. Um, I, I wasn't quite in that whole confident self-belief state just yet. I didn't know that my batting was capable of such things and it kind of just happened. Um, but it was an exciting time and I'm so grateful for having those opportunities because again, that probably would have that's shaped my next two, three years from on and knowing what I needed to work on on the on the higher um, levels of cricket. Awesome, and you're now a genuine all-rounder. Um, at that point in time, like I said, yeah. you, you came back and you didn't have a contract for the inaugural Kia Super League the first season. You then got one. You had two seasons with the Surrey Stars and then two seasons with the Western Storm. Yeah. What was this Kia Super League like? What did it do for women's cricket in the UK and how did you feel in that environment playing with and against some of the best players in the UK? Uh, the Kia Super League, for the four years that it's run, it's it's been such a big change and an important change for women's cricket. Um, more people have taken notice. We've had average crowds of around three, 4,000 people watching the game. We've had young girls get buying the merchandise and picking up a cricket bat. And the uptake of um, girls' cricket has come on so much more. And I think the Kia Super League has done a very good job in kind of kick-starting everything that's happening now. So... Um, it was definitely really good and it was almost the first time professional a professional setup was created for domestic county players as well. So aside from the England girls having the professional setup to play the international games, the level below didn't really experience anything like that. So you've got so many more county players who have experienced what a professional setup feels like with having four or five coaches looking after you, your nutrition, your psychology, um, your recovery. So having that experience almost bridges the gap between your county player and, and moving on to the next level. So it's served a really good purpose for, for all the county players and, and also generating a new um, new wave of girls playing the game too. Awesome. And that's where I suppose I've, I'm fortunate to have had a few other very good female cricketers on and, and you guys are paving the way for the next generation. You're bridging the gap from... The, the past where there was no sort of professionalism, there was no extra coaching, there was no money yep. to the future where they're going to probably be paid the same as men in um, the near future and, and have a, an amazing lifestyle. Um, however, you haven't been paid a whole lot throughout your career. What have you had to do to manage things to get by? I know you've up until recently you had a job at a school, yep. you've done some coaching. What are the things you've had to do over your career? Um, it's been... I've kind of had to make that decision between how much I wanted to train and how much I wanted to work. Um, so I have yeah worked at a high school for the last three years um, part time. So my average working week would probably be about twenty to twenty five hours, mixed with some one to ones. And you kind of have to balance working and then fitting in your training. Um, so your day ends up and en ends up being quite long. It's a twelve hour day, and it does get quite tiring and and taxing and you know, like you said, it will things like that will change in the in the near future. But um, for me, it has been quite difficult. Um, and you know, my parents, they they're supportive, but at the same time, they want to know that I'm going to be financially stable. And um, cricket at the moment doesn't offer that, so they're always quite confused as to how am I how am I going to be financially stable by doing just twenty hours a week and mm -hmm. still training for cricket and not really getting the the value back from it so mm. um, naturally they are worried about where my future what my future looks like mm. um, but then it would be silly for me to not try and not know what could happen and that's mm. kind of why I'm sticking at it for mm. now. We've had chats about this obviously yeah. in our time together and I think you should be really proud um, of the decisions you've made and I'm sure your parents um, so fully support you however they're looking out for their their daughter yeah. they're wanting what's best for her um, but I'm sure they understand that you're chasing your dream and
from my point of view, I think we only live once, so well done for having a crack. And um, any girls watching this, um, young girls, or someone watching this in, in sort of 20 years when the landscape is, is all different, yeah. these are the sort of things that a lot of people don't realise happen behind closed doors. They might see you play on TV in the 100 um, coming up this year, or they might have seen you in the, um, for the Kia Super League, but they don't realise the sacrifices you guys mm -hmm. as female crews had to make, so well done to you and, <laughs> and the, your peers as well. You're out here playing for Midland Guildford, as I mentioned. You got here at the start of January, having three and a bit months here. Yeah. How has this time been for you so far? Oh, it's been probably, again, one of the best decisions I've made to come out here and, and work on my game. I was umming and ahhing about coming um, out uh, this winter, um, but it's, you know, playing out on, on turf and um, just playing games. You learn so much more than um, training in an indoor winter net uh, for six months and it's been a really good experience that the club have been great um, and I've really got a chance to work on those mental routines that um, I needed to do I've been pra trying to practice them indoors but like I said in a high pressure situation and that's when it really counts um, to try and put those routines into place so I feel like I can go home and kind of be quite happy with what mental routines I've come up with um, and try and use them for my best, for, for my games back home. Awesome, we'll get in a little bit more into your mindset shortly, but you've had some success since yeah. you've been here. It's, did you feel like coming out this time, mm. three years later with a little bit more cricket behind you, you um, did you feel any more pressure? Have you felt like you've got to perform well for Midland? Um, how different has the experience been from when you were at Paran? And you've done well, as I said, so what do you think the keys are or have been to your success this season? Um, yeah, it was certainly very different coming out here. Almost all the players knew who I'd play for. They'd seen cl clips on of me at the Kia Super League and, and things like that. So um, there was definitely a lot more expectation, but I think it was more expectation on myself that I needed to come here as an overseas score, run, score runs, take wickets, and show, show why I play those levels of cricket back home. Um, so I did find it tough at the start. Um, but you know, after after kind of working on my mindset the last twelve months to eighteen months on confidence and and self belief and um, just enjoying what I'm doing, um, it almost once I remind myself of that, it almost became a lot easier to just go out and do what I'm here to do, not worry about what everyone else thinks, and um, it's easier said than done for sure. Um, but um, that was that's probably something that I'm really happy about and and just working on keeping that confidence going and mm. um, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned whilst being here is not worrying about expectations and just worrying about yourself which will hopefully hold you in good stead going home when there yeah. there are lots of expectations now you said about working on your mindset yeah. what are the certain what are the things you've done over the last 18 months that you talk about um I think Journaling is probably one of the key things that I've done. Every day I'll write down um, uh, something that I'm going to do for the day, so a direction, um, and then I'll write something quite positive, so some self-believing thoughts that make me feel quite uncomfortable to write, um, but that's why I write them and almost try and repeat them two or three times to um, to make make me get comfortable being that person so and believe and, and believe that that's actually going to happen so a really key one that I'd, I'd probably like to share with people is um, after two years of playing Surrey Stars I unfortunately didn't retain that contract and I was a bit in limbo I was like I don't know, even know what Super League team I'm going to play for um, and so I started writing I believe I'm going to play for Western Storm kept writing that um, over and over again every day I had no affiliation with Western Storm whatsoever. I just thought, oh, maybe that team, that team looks like a really good setup. I would like to play for that team. And then certain things started happening. You know, then I started believing it. I went to the trials, I'm still writing the same thing every day. And then two, three months later, I've got the contract. And I Amazing. just find like that's a really, you know, it might be a coincidence, it might not. Um, but with the fact that I believed it, and then when I went to the trial, I bat batted so well, I almost su surprised myself that I could do that. Um, 
So I think writing things like that definitely has helped my confidence and mm. um, you know that's that's come from my personal trainer back home who, who's probably worked closely with me with my mindset um, in the gym and, and um, off the field as well will give me little tasks to do every every week and kind of just go out and stick to them and be consistent doing mm. that so um, it's, it's not magic it's just no, something no. to have you, have you heard the story of Jim Carrey writing himself a check no, no Jim Carrey wrote himself a 10 million dollar check and said <laughs> I'll be cashing this in in three years and three years later he got a role that paid him 10 million dollars oh, wow. so there I, I truly believe in, in affirmations and cr- creating a vision and um, yeah the, the self-talk we have is, is really, really important. Um, how do you deal with nerves, anxiety, stress, um, whether that's in your everyday life or whether that's around performance and on game day? Um, I think something that I've recently started is meditation, just to try and calm down. I think I am quite a sh- stressful per- like a stress person or an overthinker, but... I think if you have coping mechanisms like breathing, which I've learned through meditation, or um, just trying to like even slow slow yourself down when you're talking. So if you feel like you're nervous and I'm talking to my partner at the other end, I can almost notice myself talking really quickly. And I'm like, maybe I just need to slow down. And I've just become more aware of mm-hmm. signs of that. Um, so just coping with that slightly better um, has allowed me to deal with those nerves and being under pressure and and um especially on game day game day um i would love to like play a game of football or something with like my other teammates and just take my mind that i'm playing cricket in about an hour's time mm-hmm. and so doing things to just take me off i i can't sit down and chill out for an hour that would be the worst thing for me to do because that would allow me loads of thoughts to come into my head that i don't need so actively doing something fun um, mm. and and trying to incorporate that into my week so um, whether it, I've sometimes done a bit of rock climbing now and again or go to the driving range and just going to do something fun to kind of renew yourself every mm. week that's kind of helped me stay mm. like pressure free and keep mm. the nerves down in general. You speak about fun and you spoke about starting as a nine year old. Yeah. I've asked this question, I asked this question of Kate Cross recently. Do you think you still get as much fun and enjoyment out of cricket as you did as a nine-year-old? Or is it really hard to now juggle having fun and just playing with complete freedom and joy with trying to build a career and be a professional out of the cricket? I think it's really difficult to just have fun and not worry about your cricket career because there's something on the line. Um... But if you're having fun, you're probably playing your best cricket. So I've certainly fluctuated between the two, and I probably fluctuate that in a game. Um, I probably go from saying, oh, it just doesn't matter, just have fun. If you miss the ball, you miss the ball. If you drop the catch, you drop the catch, but just have fun and with the people around you. And then, yeah, you're going to play better. But it's actually really difficult to not worry about the expectation or the, the future of what your performance here leads to. Um, but I think when you can find a way to enjoy yourself and trust yourself that I've put in all the hard work in the other six days and when it comes to the game day I can just relax and have fun if you can get to that kind of point and you can repeat that that's where success lies that's where you're going to have the most success for sure so it's just trusting what you've put in the hard work and that's done now Mm. leave that aside and now trust yourself that you can have fun and your skills will come out mm. free flowing um, yeah. and then you'll be successful. How do you let go? How do you deal with mistakes or bad performances? Um, I'll probably self reflect after a game. So if I've had a bad performance, I'll still write, maybe write down a couple of things that went well um, and try and draw out some positives out of the day because there's always positives out of what you're doing. Um, or And then reflect on. You know, if I got out nicking the ball, uh, was that shot there to play? Would I do it again? Yes, no. Um, did I execute what I wanted to do? Wanted to do yes or no? And if if you've done what you're set out to do and you answer yes, then then you're fine. It's not a bad performance. You just didn't execute it well. If 
if you went chasing after a ball that you're not normally used to, then you'd reflect and say, well, I probably need to put that shot away. That's not something how I play. So mm. that's that's as simple as I'll go for reflecting on what I've what I've done and and then just taking it into a positive and moving on for the next game. Yeah, very very good advice. Yeah. Um, and I suppose you have to forgive yourself for mistakes, yeah. don't you? And yeah. for getting something wrong in your game and in the game, the highest at the highest level. What do you think is the breakdown of technical versus mental? I think to play at the highest level, you've got to have some kind of sound technique to get there. Otherwise, you'll I think you'll get found out quite quickly. Um, but then after that, you know, you might not have the most perfect technique, but you've got a very strong mindset and mentality. So if you can kind of get your technique up to as best as you can without being a perfectionist, I guess, and but then really working on your mentality, I think it will put you in a better in a, in a better um, state to play the game because you'll be able to deal with. I guess your weaknesses, you know what your weakness is. The other team probably know what your weaknesses are. But if you can maximise your strengths because of your mentality, I know I'm going to hit the ball, pull the ball if it's in my slot every single time, uh, 10 times out of 10, then then that's fine. I think when you get to the high level, that's kind of where you probably need to be, is get your technique to the highest point, and then mentality takes over and out out do your bowling partner at the other end other end and as you said before a number yeah. of times trust yourself trust your game trust yeah. your process not worry about your technique because mm. i think that's a big thing amateurs do and players yeah. who don't quite reach their full potential they worry about their technique yeah. a lot which doesn't then allow them to focus their energy and attention on the present moment and yeah. reacting to the ball What's the importance of fitness in the modern game? Do you think you've been since you've been here? I've seen firsthand how hard you're training on your fitness. Yeah. Um, what do you think in women's cricket now, prof- professionally, the importance of women's cricket is, uh, fitness is? Oh, I think it's massive. I think um, if you've got two players in front of you with the same skill set and and everything, and one's fitter than the other, you're getting picked over the one that's fitter. So. Well, um, I heard. Sorry to cut you off. I heard a story from the strength and conditioning coach yeah. at the WACA. Um, he said in the Women's World Cup, one, there was a borderline selection and one player got selected over the other because of the 2K time trial. Wow. Yeah, so there you go. Like that, that explains it all. If you, you know, there's, your, your skill set's always going to be quite similar to someone else and that's your competition when you get to that level. So fitness is one of the things you can control. Um, and if you're putting in the work and being that much more fit than than your counterpart, um, then you're gonna be able to get find yourself in the playing eleven, and I think it's so important. And it also allows you to be a bit more agile in the field. You might be able to dive for balls that you didn't think you could, or chase balls on the boundary that you didn't think you could. So it definitely serves a massive part in cricket in the modern game. Mm, absolutely, and it's something that. We're really um, sort of passionate about yeah. cricket mentoring is trying to create holistic athletes. Um, I know you've got a background in some personal training yeah. as well. You're studying. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I've always had a passion for sports science and just recently come to the end of a, a personal training course and a bit of sports massage too. So, um, you know, on the side, I'd like to kind of work on that area and 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 it's really good playing a sport and trying to put the two together i can Mm. i can like test out stuff in the gym and see how that works and see that response so it's quite a good um matching of 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 the two things so um one day that will be i guess my full-time job Mm. if cricket doesn't work out yeah awesome that's really exciting and great to continually be upskilling yourself off the field how do you get away from the game how do you switch off and relax what do you do um, I think I'm quite a social person. I like to go for coffees with like different people. Um, just go f- watch a movie, or um, like I said, I've like, experimented with rock climbing, and um, I actually really enjoy like going to the gym as well. Just like I said, experimenting with stuff or trying out a new fitness class here or something like that. So um, that's kind of how I switch off and kind of escape escape the real world and, and just trying to be as social as I can but also 
I'm quite an introvert too, so I need my own time to maybe listen to a podcast or um, just watch a movie by myself um, at home as well. Mm. Now, this is something we've worked on over the last few weeks, but give everyone a bit of an insight into your pre-ball routine. And you've had success recently for Midland. What do you do? What are you doing at the moment? What are you working on with your pre-ball and post-ball routine? Um, So once I've played a ball or just before I'm facing up, I'll, I'll walk over to square leg and kind of use the white line um, on the side to kind of step out of. So I use that to step out of and kind of have my thoughts. And we've been working on um, a, a process of reflecting, relaxing, and then refocusing. So um, I'd reflect what that ball was, you know, maybe it would be something technical that I didn't quite achieve there or or I just didn't hit the ball into a gap, I'd reflect on that and then um, give myself time to relax. And that's probably the hardest part that we've been working on is the relaxing part. Um, We've been speaking about how I haven't given myself a chance to actually relax. So um, maybe it's, like you said, walking, um, looking at the river and who's walking around or um, chatting to the wicketkeeper or maybe having a little chat to the square leg umpire for a little bit um so definitely been working on that a lot more and um the two two innings that i've been really successful here i've i've done that i've had a conversation with someone at mid wicket or just just um taking my mind off it and that's been my relaxing time mm-hmm. and then when it comes to facing up again i've kind of set my feet i'm balanced i've got my head going towards the ball um, and then I've just refocused on the white ball as they're starting to run up and that's probably what my routine is and I think I need to keep working on the relaxing part and make make sure my teammates know that that's what I want to do as well so it might be a case of them coming up to me mid-over and just telling me something funny um, so that's a work in progress but I've def- definitely seen the um, signs of success through what I've been doing out here Mm. and as we've spoken about in our sessions it's that's where your true success is going to come there's a few technical things that you can adjust and adapt which everybody has but your real sort of great success is going to come and consistency is going to come by nailing that routine and that process and getting your focus back for every ball being able to relax and not drain your sort of mental capacity really quickly Um, moving on Back to sort of the women's game. Yeah. You're a bit of a pioneer in women's cricket in yeah. the UK in the fact that you're one of only a few sort of um, female Asian cricketers that played in the Kia Super League. Yeah. Why do you think there aren't many of your generation, but surely that's going to change moving forward? Um, it's a tricky one because the Asian population are massive on cricket. They love their cricket. So, And, and back home, you know, even where I live, uh, there's a high um, population of Asian um, ethnic minorities and you know I've been looking into it a lot more and trying to understand why there aren't more coming through the system and I, I think it's an educational thing with the parents um, and and the the girls themselves knowing that they're probably going to have to make a lot more harder decisions growing up and um, missing social occasions and uh, sacrificing the food that they, you know, Asians make lovely food. So it's sacrificing that I probably can't have that, or I need to moderate what I'm eating at my cousin's house or my family's house or at the wedding or things like that. And being able to factor factor that into their into their progress. And when it comes to the ed- education of the parents, they all know um, what the pathway is to be successful in education and um, and getting a job and kind of following that trend of then getting married and, and so on. Um, and being secure. And being secure because I guess their generation, uh, where they came from, you know, my parents came from born in Kenya and lived in India for a lot of their time. You know, education was... was everything. Hard, yeah, everything. And, and that was the way that they were going to be successful. So yeah. they almost don't know that sport can be a career. And I think the more we educate the parents and the more we educate the younger girls, the more we're going to see them come through the system. And I know just working with the South Asian uh, ECB programme, um, a meeting few of the parents, they almost had no idea 
kind of what the pathway was when I, once I explained um, that that's, this is what I've done. So once we do that, I think we'll start seeing a lot more Asian girls come through the system. Mm. Um, but we need we need more at the top of the game so they can aspire to be, mm. um, they can see that there's Asian girls, otherwise this is never going to happen. Um, you know, w- you know I'll, I'll put my hand up and hopefully someone can aspire to follow the journey that I, I've been through and a couple of other girls are trying to pave the way for the same things too. So mm. I don't think it will be long till we see more and mm. I'm keen to mentor and help a few young girls on, on that pathway should they choose to pick cr- cricket as a career, which they 100% can now mm. as full-time professional for sure. Thank you for being your community, your culture. Um, you're, you're an inspiration and, and no doubt there will be a lot of young girls aspiring to be the next name of Zatani. So the Women's World Cup final, the whole World Cup, but having 86,000 plus fans, spectators at the MCG for women's cricket, you were there yourself, that will be a game changer. And like you say, that will open the eyes of a lot of parents, I'm sure, to say, yes, um, nine-year-old Naomi, we want to support yeah. you and really encourage you to chase this dream. Yeah, I think um, that day was just incredible to be there um, as a fan and as a cricket player myself. Um, I almost just sat back and just observed what was going on. I, I wasn't the one cheering or screaming because it you know, I I just couldn't believe that there was this many people. You know, I think there was a couple behind me that were really into the game. They knew who Ashley Gardner was, Beth Mooney, Alyssa Healy. They they knew their stats, their everything. And you're like, this is women's cricket now. Mm. People, your average Joe knows what Beth Mooney's stats are, and and it was incredible to um, to just witness eighty six thousand people really supporting women, um, women in sport. Um, the cricket and, and the platform that it's really going to really gonna create for um, future future generations. And has it inspired you even more to try and get to that level and one day be in front of a packed house in a World Cup final? I mean, yeah, um, just I was trying to picture myself sometimes like standing out in the middle and what, what I'd feel being out there and I almost was really excited that this could be this could happen one day and actually I, I can't wait for it to happen mm. um, and it's made me want to work harder and um, just keep going on the journey that I am. Uh, you know, at one point I was going to just give up cricket because I didn't think there was much available but now everything's changing. It's almost silly not to um, stay in the game and see what, where it can take you because there are so many opportunities opening up for everyone at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, well done to you for chasing your dream. I, I, as we've spoken about before, I think if you get to 30 and it hasn't worked out, you can always go yeah. and get a job and you're upskilling yourself, yeah. you're, you're building a life outside of cricket as well. So you've got to have that there for you when, yeah. when cricket finishes. But I'd love to see you one day yeah. in an England shirt playing in a World Cup final. And I really do hope it happens. Um, You've got the 100 coming up this year. Yeah. How, tell us a bit about that and how you're feeling about being part of the London Spirit, which is going to feature the England captain Heather Knight and their opening batter Tammy Bowman. How, you must be excited to team up with them. Yeah, really excited. I think we've got a few few girls um, coming over from the Western Storm contingent coming over to London Spirit, so it's going to be quite familiar. Um, and it's always great working with um, Heather um, as well and also coming back to my hometown um, which would be really great having the affiliation uh, with Middlesex. I'm really looking forward to the competition. It's a, it sounds like a really good initiative. Um, being also aligned with the men, everyone's on the same playing field um, and having the opportunity to play at Lords, which is going to be incredible. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the competition and um, and everything that it's, it's going to bring and hopefully attract more crowds and just be bigger and better than than the KSL um, than the KSL was. You mentioned Lords there. You've been the captain of Middlesex yeah. in the past three years. Have you managed to play on Lords a few times? Yeah, we had a um, we have a London Cup game against Surrey in the T20 every year. Um, who are um, 
and last year we had a game at Lords, but due to rain, it, we only played a five over game. But it was such a good game and we won on the last ball and holding the title for the last five years now. So wow. not letting Surrey have a sniff in just yet. <laughs> uh, excellent. Yeah. I'm very fortunate, um, having played for Middlesex yeah. myself, to have spent a bit of time at Lords and, yeah. and it's such a special ground, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. When we, there's a really um, iconic picture, which I think it got nominated for Photo of the Year for Wisden Cricket, with all of us Middlesex girls are walking out of the long room and... Um, taking the field uh, onto Lords and just walking through the long room or coming down from the changing rooms, you, you're almost like there's been some some serious talent that have come from these um, from these changing rooms and people that have walked through the long room um, before us and yeah, it was just a really special day and just soaked it up from from ball from ball one or waiting around on the sideline as mm. well so it, it was a good day well no doubt there'll be many more great days at lords um, in your future in your career yeah. hopefully not just for the london spirit but also for england and we'll be certainly supporting you throughout all of that um now before we wrap up some questions i ask all our guests is what is common in the best players that you've seen i think consistency what they do every day in day out and it's the simple things um I think sometimes people overcomplicate when they see a professional cricketer or sports person. They think there's this magic formula that they do, uh, that they do. And I think the best players in the world are consistent with the basic things. Um, so things like going to sleep at the same time every day and having the same nutritious food every day and um, doing your gym session, doing all of that, just doing those basic things every single day um, and being consistent with it is probably what's going to make them the most successful and I don't think there's any magic pill mm, <laughs> to, to swallow not. to do that. If you're consistent, you you can achieve anything, basically. Yeah. Who's the hardest opponent you've played against? Uh, I don't really like bowling against Susie Bates. Um, she's played a few county seasons over here, um, over in, uh, in the UK, and she just hits the ball 360 and I, you know, you've you've got to take a chance. If, if she, gives, she gives you a chance, you've got to take a chance. So I think she's probably one of the most dynamic batters I've uh, bowled against, but it's always a good uh, competition against her. Yeah. What advice would you give to your younger self? Um, not to worry about what people think. I think that's probably the biggest one and just go about what, what you want to do and if someone thinks negatively of it then it doesn't matter you just keep doing because you know you're having fun I think if I could have learned that from a younger age um, maybe things could have fast tracked a bit earlier who knows mm -hmm. but definitely just not to worry about what people think because at the end of the day it's your life and it's your career and future and that is such um, profound advice and it's something that we try and preach to our cricket mentoring community it, it is your life and although you want to please people, you want to fit in, we all need to understand we've got to do what we want to do. Um, as long as it's not harmful to others yeah. or it's not um, illegal, um, we, if we have dreams we should be chasing because we only get one life. So brilliant, brilliant advice. What's next for you? Uh, next, obviously, go back home for the UK season. Um, Hopefully the weather and everything uh, is promising, but and the virus and the virus too. Uh, with just a few um, pre-season games that have already been cancelled, unfortunately. But um, yeah, go back and just keep keep going with the momentum that I've created here and working on those mental routines. Um, probably go back into some coaching and working with a few few young talent, uh, some girls over there, um, uh, and then just kick the county season running and, and, and everything that follows after it. When does the county season get underway? Um, it'll be the first weekend of May that we start our 2020 campaign. Right, well fingers crossed everything's okay by then and you're, yeah. you're into it and like you say you can use what you've learned and done here to your success over there. Now, why do you play cricket? Um, I play cricket for the reasons that the lessons I learn in cricket about myself I, I learn them off the field too, so I feel like I've learned, I get to train um, the mind, the body and everything that I do in cricket and then take that outside of the game too. So I really like how them two kind of work together and 
um, without cricket I don't think I would have learned as much as I've learned about myself so um, that's probably why I play cricket and, and just taking the field with 10 other girls and uh, who also have their own reasons for loving the game and just having a good time on the pitch. Awesome, awesome. Now before I ask the last question, yeah. how can people follow your journey? Um, follow me on Instagram, it's at Naomi.Tani um, or on Twitter which is just at Naomi Dutani. Um, Instagram is probably the place where I probably post more of my fitness workouts and, and things like that so that would be a good place to have a look. Awesome and we're also going to be releasing a, a day in the life of video with you. We had um, our videographer Spurry spend a day with you um, so you gave us an amazing insight into your training what you do when you're not training and um, your, your gym sessions, you're running, etc. So that'll be coming out very soon. So guys, when you're listening um, or watching this, make sure you check that out as well. Now, the final question I ask everyone on this podcast is, what is your definition of success? I'm just going to answer with one word, and that's consistency. As I mentioned before, um, same thing, consistent day in, day out, you're going to be successful. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Naomi, thank you very much. Thank you for coming thank on you. and sharing your journey, your story. It's very inspiring. There's so much power, and I really do hope it inspires um, more young Asian women, girls in, in the UK and around the world to try and do what you've done and play um, cricket at a high level and hopefully at the highest level, yeah. which you'll do at some point in the future. So, well done and good luck. Thank you for having me. Thank you.